again this so again this is a child who presented with bull leg with mild itching as well as minimal systemic symptoms again this is diagnosed as a case of staph infection called as bullus impetigo treatment is same since this is a bacterial infection give systemic antibiotics systemic antihistamine and topical fusidine cream sometimes the skin infections similar to impetigo will become more deeply invasive this is caused by the streptococcus such type of infection we call it as ecthyma so ecthyma goes through the outer layer that is called as the epidermis and it goes to the deeper layer that is the dermis so any skin lesions or any skin disease which involves the dermis or the subcutaneous will ultimately result in scarring any skin infections which involve the superficial layer of the skin that is the epidermis will heal without scarring this is the basic thing which we have to keep in our mind because if a patient comes with scarring previous history of scarring and a newer infection like this then definitely you should think of a deep skin infection that is called as ecthyma so deep skin infection means it is streptococcus so like that you have to treat further antibiotics further uh, anti inflammatories or injection antibiotics should be given to this patient there is a rare uh, thing which is called as ecthyma gangrenosum also this is a bacterial skin infection which is caused by pseudomonas aeruginosa and this is usually seen in immunocompromised individuals next is folliculitis another very common infection folliculitis means infection of the hair follicle so this is a bacterial infection of hair follicle again caused by staph but occasionally pseudomonas may also be the culprit there so this bacteria is usually in laminated wall folds hot tubs etc so uh, it is also commonly seen among children as well as the uh, mason workers i am seeing lot of cases of folliculitis among the mason workers also these are the uh, pictures of folliculitis it manifests as superficial pustules or inflammatory nodules thing is that this will be surrounding a hair follicle from that name itself it will be surrounding a hair follicle that is called as folliculitis few patients will be presenting to us with lesions over the beard area that is called as psychosis barbe that is a folliculitis occurring over the hair follicles of over, over the beard next is pharyngeal carbuncle pharyngeal these are skin abscesses caused by staph infection which involve a hair follicle and surrounding tissue but carbuncle what is the difference these are smaller more super uh, these are this is more deeper infection that is they uh, go into the subcutaneous tissue clusters of pharyngeal connected subcutaneously causing deeper separation and scarring so pharyngeal won't scar carbuncle will scar the basic thing is that whatever affects the epidermis will not scar whatever affects the dermis as well as the subcutaneous will result in scarring this is carbuncle large inflammatory plaque studded with multiple pustules some will be uh, ruptured draining pus can be seen the common site is in the nape of the neck and nowadays due to this hot humid climate we are seeing lot of cases of pharyngeal carbuncle etc thing is that we have to look for other immunosuppression in these patients cellulitis very common condition cellulitis uh, i think i don't want to talk much about cellulitis because everybody knows how to diagnose cellulitis but one thing i would like to stress here is how will you differentiate cellulitis from erysipelas see cellulitis this is cellulitis this is an acute bacterial infection of the skin and subcutaneous tissue caused by strepto and staph it can occur anywhere on the body in adult it often occurs on the leg face arms in children it is most common on the face or around the anus an infection on the face could lead to the dangerous eye infection this is erysipelas this is a superficial cellulitis with dermal lymphatic involvement see the difference this is characterized by shiny raised indurated and tender plaque like lesion with distinct margin the thing is that to differentiate cellulitis from erysipelas you keep one thing in your mind cellulitis the margins will not be well defined that will be merging with the normal skin but in the case of erysipelas you will get a sharp demarcated edge or a margin that is the basic difference of cellulitis and erysipelas 
very rare case necrotizing fasciitis i have not come across such a case of necrotizing maybe the surgical department next is hydradenitis suppurativa again a very common disease which you are seeing daily in our opd this is a chronic disease usually the patient presents with a small nodule or a small abscess uh, in the axilla but once once we take the history from the patient the patient will be saying that such types of lesions are occurring in this patient uh, as a uh, chronic history that that means a chronic history will be there from the patient so don't think of arangal don't think of any folliculitis don't think of uh, carbuncle like that if it's a chronic history such lesions occurring in the axilla in the groin you have to think of hydradenitis suppurativa see this is very commonly seen among females majority of the cases i have come across of hydradenitis suppurativa they are all females the sites are in the axilla the nipples under the breast perineum groin etc what is the basic thing here this is a inflammatory disease of apocrine gland follicles so whatever you give you give antibiotic you give anti inflammatory you give topical antibiotics the latest antibiotic oxinoxin topical cream you give it will heal but it will recur what is the underlying pathology it is disease of apocrine gland folliculitis the best treatment is you refer to the plastic surgeon do plastic surgery just take off that apocrine glands Uh, another thing about uh, which I uh, uh, about this hydradenitis suppurativa is that uh, we can treat this condition with injection uh, tricot also, but still recurrence will be there. Uh, then uh, systemic retinoids are also given. Doxycycline is also tried. Then uh, systemic uh, yeah tetracycline they are all tried, but still the treatment of choice I would prefer is go for plastic surgery. erythrasma another common condition we will be in a doubt what is this is it a bacterial infection or a fungal infection this is a bacterial infection that occurs in areas where skin touches skin usually in the groin between the toes armpits this interfaceous infection this is caused by foreign bacteria minutiscum uh, some patients will be coming to you with bad odor so if you look at the axilla of such patients on the axillary hair you can see white spots that is corine bacteria minutiscum this is a bacteria this is a bacterial infection uh, don't confuse it has a fungal infection by seeing that white spot even if you give antifungals this will not respond so if you are in doubt you try clotrimazole cream the patient is not getting any response definitely the diagnosis you have to change it as erythrasma try topical antibiotic you will get excellent results the another thing is the mrsa skin infections everybody knows methicillin resistant staph aureus caused by staph and excessive antibiotic abuse i would say abuse it outfits all but the most powerful drug is vancomycin the mode of entry is through cuts and wounds uh i think more about mrsa i don't want to say one thing i want to stress here is recurrent skin infections recurrent skin infection should raise the suspicion of colonization mainly what you are i am seeing is a staphylococcal nasal carriage another thing is a resistant strains of bacteria poorly controlled diabetes immunocompromised state and other conditions like hiv hepatitis advanced stage what i see in my practice day to day practice the cause of recurrent skin infection is a staphylococcal nasal carriage as well as poorly controlled diabetes in the first visit in our bcop uh, we may fail to ask the history of diabetes next time the patient will be coming back with recurrent infection then only we ask about the history of diabetes diabetes would not be uh, maybe uh, not be properly controlled so you have to control that diabetes then only this infection will subside another thing i have to i will be stressing is on the staphylococcal nasal carriage any patient coming to you with recurrence of the skin infections you try to treat the nasal carriage how you will treat the nasal carriage i told that fusidic acid is the best topical antibiotic cream so far i have used i have not come across any uh, contact dermatitis or any written cds with fusidic acid so for treating staphylococcal nasal carriage uh, you apply this uh, fusidic cream in the nasal vestibule both axilla the groins as well as in the uh, anal area this you apply every month for 5 days 
this you have to continue it for five months you will get excellent results this recurrent infection can be controlled i think about 70 to 75 percent days this recurrent infections can be controlled so the, this already i have told the staph carriage elimination by nasal and perineal care another drug is rifampicin you can try 600 mg uh, daily for 7 to 10 days Clindamycin 150 mg per day for three months. I have not used it. I have used rifampicin. I have got results, but still I am uh, happy with topical fusidic acid. Topical mupirocin also you can give. I think now the uh, we don't have the government supply of topical fusidic acid. We have government supply of topical mupirocin only. This is staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. I think pediatricians have come across this. This is mainly due to the exfoliative toxin. This is caused by staphylococcal strain, which elaborates an epidermolytic toxin. And this is more common in infants than in adult. The toxic shock syndrome, localized growth of toxigenic strains in vagina or wound. It starts abruptly with fever, hypotension, and diffuse macular erythematous rash. Multiple organs and system are involved. Entire body, skin, these gametes. So what are the laboratory diagnosis of bacterial infection? Usually I don't do these laboratory investigations. You can do it if you want. We can do a skin biopsy, skin swab, pus swab, nasal swab, etc. But clinical diagnosis is very important in any uh, skin diseases. First, you should have a clinical diagnosis. Our clinical diagnosis is supported by lab only. So the principles of therapy, you should have a good personal hygiene. You have to manage the predisposing factors. I already told in my first slide, the skin dryness is a good uh, protective factor for skin. So you can use aluminum chloride, which inhibits the overgrowth of opportunistic bacteria. You can use keratinolytic agents like topical salicylates that will remove the hyperkeratotic lesions. Systemic uh, disease like diabetes, nutrition deficiency, immunodeficiency, all should be corrected. This recently I come across this case. Yesterday, this case presented to me. This patient presented to one of the PHCs with uh, cellulitis. So initially it was cellulitis. The treatment uh, given by the uh, by the center, it, it was perfect, perfect treatment. Topical antibiotic, then uh, uh, anti-inflammatories, seratio and diclo was given. Uh, give me a second, just a second, give me one second. Uh, so topical antibiotics, systemic antibiotics, uh, systemic anti-inflammatory, seratio with diclo was given. But the thing is that uh, for this cellulitis, the patient was prescribed uh, glycerin maxalf. And, and this glycerin maxalf was, uh, this patient was asked to apply glycerin maxalf over the lesion and cover the lesion. What we call it as an occlusive therapy. So what happens is that sometimes this content of this glycerin maxalfide will be uh, we produce allergy contact dermatitis to that particular skin. So this case presented with allergy contact dermatitis to glycerin maxalf. So I think this, this maxalf is good, but uh, uh, right now we are having good topical antibiotics. So better avoid maxalf occlusive dressings. You can apply maxalf and we will talk, but don't do occlusive dressings over these areas, particularly in the lower. Area. So this, this was that case. Now coming to the, so the, these are all the uh, bacterial infections which we come across in our day-to-day -day OP practice. Coming to the fungal infection. Fungal infections, we have the superficial, the cutaneous, the subcutaneous and the systemic infections. I'll be mainly dealing with the superficial fungal infections because everybody knows dermatology is a sea. What all I am telling here is just a spoon of water from that sea. So superficial fungal infections. No more theories. I'll just show the pictures and I'll just uh, run it. So, what is this? Any idea about this lesion? This is, is it hypopigmented or hypopigmented? What about this lesion? This lesion is hyperpigmented. If you just see this lesion, these lesions have borders. These are called as the polycyclic borders. So, any idea what this lesion is? This is uh, tinea versicolor. So you might have seen hypopigmented cases of tinea versicola. This is pigmented version of tinea versicola. So does two versions exist? Yes, two types of tinea versicola exist. We have the pigmented and the non-pigmented type. So what you are seeing here is the hyphae of this 
uh, organism. That's the Malassezia furfa. So hypopigmented tinea versicola is because of the dicarboxylic acid this fungus secretes, which inhibits the dopa tyrosinase reaction. The dopa tyrosinase reaction is an important pathway in formation of melanin. So if that pathway is inhibited, what happens? Melanin will not be formed. If melanin is not produced, what happens? The lesion becomes hypopigmented. So we have hypopigmented lesion. We also get hypopigmented lesion because of the thick stratum. Because of the thick stratum, maybe this organism cannot penetrate inside and produce this dicarboxylic acid. So there is no inhibition of dopa tyrosinase reaction. So what happens? You will get a hyperpigmented, uh, hypopigmented lesion. Of course, uh, tinea versicola will be asymptomatic. It presents as a macule and diagnosis is by KOH mon, which I have already shown. Management of tinea versicola. There is topical management as well as systemic management. What, which drug is available in our hospitals, in our uh, PHC, uh, FHC, PHCs? We have clotrimazole, we have selenium sulfide, zinc pyrethron, systemic, we can start uh, ketoconazole or fluconazole. So what I'm going to say right now is, if you're seeing a case of tinea versicola, because in our OP, majority, our OP daily, it's around 350 to 400, sometimes 450 to 500. And many a time, only two dermatologists will be there. Uh, out of the 200 cases which I am seeing daily, I think it will be around 100 cases of tinea versicola. And all patients are coming from the peripheries. They have shown to the FHCs, they have shown to the uh, MOs there. You have given excellent prescription, clotrimazole, everything you have given, but still the patient is coming here. What is happening there? Thing is that if you are prescribing clotrimazole, or myconazole or terbinafine or anything but never steroid. You tell the patient, you apply this cream, BD, apply it in the morning, apply it in the night. You have to apply it at least for two months. Within two months, no doctor shopping. Don't go anywhere. It will take two months for this lesion to subside. This patient will apply for one week, thinking that this is a fever. Fever subsides by one week, but tinea won't subside. So they will come back. Even uh, when they are coming to our OP, they, they might have applied clotrimazole, every type of cream for one week. Uh, this will not subside. Again, after one week, they'll go to another center. So we, uh, what I advise the patient is, you have to apply these creams, BD application for two months. Only after two months, I should see your face. Never come in front of me. If you want a systemic uh, treatment, systemic treatment for tinea versicola, you give if it is an extensive involvement. One tinea, two tinea, etc. you just give topical treatment. But if it is an extensive involvement, the drug which is available in our PHCs is fluconazole. You can give what it is available is fluconazole 150 mg. The doses you can give fluconazole 400 mg stat dose. But we don't have 200 mg or 400 mg available. What I do is I give two tablets of 150 mg. At least it is 300 mg. So just prescribe that. And prescribe topical antifungal and ask the patient to take it after one month. Then relapse occurs. Of course, relapse occurs. But relapse occurs if the patient uh, uh, comes to you after two months. Even after two months, if the lesion is not subsiding, then you can call that lesion as the relapsed case of tinea versicola. Such cases, you can prescribe ketoconazole 400 mg once per month, itraconazole 400 mg monthly once for six months. But before prescribing ketoconazole or itraconazole, better do a liver function test. Next is the other superficial fungal infection, the tinea corporis, cruris, axillary, sangam, pedis, manum, capitis, fascia, incognito. Lot of tinea's are there. This is the typical picture of tinea corporis. So if you see this lesion, what is this lesion? This lesion has got a red color. That is called as erythema. So this is a typical red colored lesion. You can see the scaly. Uh, this will be a scaly lesion. And what you are seeing here is the peripheral activity with central clearance. This is typical of tinea. So this, is, this, this uh, uh, since it is seen on the body, we call it as tinea corporis. This is tinea fasci. If you closely see this uh, girl, you can see a lesion here. Peripheral activity. Another lesion, you can make it out here. This is the another lesion. 
which you can make it out here. These are all the central clearance. So this is a case of tinea fasciae. Again, a case of tinea fasciae. If you closely look, see for the border. This is the border. This is the border in this patient. And see, these are all the scaling and you can see the central clearance. Tinea fasciae. Again, this uh, boy with this peripheral activity and you can see a rounded lesion here. Again, a case of tinea fasciae. So why I showed this screen is that this lady presented earlier presented with a single lesion like this, but later presented to us with multiple lesions. So earlier the disease subsided, but now it exacerbated. What was prescribed here? Betamethasone and some other cream. I don't know what it is. But majority what uh, we are seeing is that in the case of tinea infection, once you are seeing this erythema and scaling, majority will prescribe either keto B or uh, clotrimazole with beclomethasone or any other antifungal with a steroid cream. But one thing I would like to say here is if you are confident that this is a case of tinea, never prescribe uh, combination treatment. You prescribe a systemic antifungal and a topical antifungal. See, this is another case of tinea incognito. This patient also presented with a single lesion. He was prescribed with a combination of steroid with antifungal and the disease exacerbated. See, once you prescribe a steroid with antifungal, first visit, the patient will be coming to you with a single lesion. You have prescribed a steroid with an antifungal. You will get excellent result. The lesion will fade off within two to three days. But after one week or two weeks, the lesion exacerbates. It spreads to all other sites and the patient will be coming back to you. And what the patient asks here is, can you prescribe the same medicine which you have prescribed earlier? Because when I apply that, the lesion subsides within two to three days. The basic here is, I have already told that there is a peripheral activity. Have you ever thought why this peripheral activity occurs? In your tinea, tinea lesion, we have central clearance and peripheral activity. This peripheral activity is a body's immune response to eliminate the fungus from the body. So that immune response uh, is shown on the skin surface as erythema and more inflammation. So that is body's protective mechanism. So to reduce that inflammation or what steroid does there, steroid will reduce that inflammatory response so that erythema is gone. Clinically, if you are seeing or visually, if you are seeing that redness has gone, but that redness means the body's protective mechanism has gone. So what happens? Fungal multiplication occurs. So this fungal multiplication later results in extensive tinea, which we call as tinea incognito. Never use topical steroid. You will be a very good doctor to that patient because the first cream which you have given uh, resulted in excellent uh, subsidence of this lesion within two days, but later it will come back. So patients who uh, come to my practice, I never give topical steroids. Even if it is highly inflammatory, I never give topical steroids. So I will be a bad doctor for them because the response without topical steroid or with plain antifungal will take around 10 to 15 days but you will get complete clearance of the lesion within two months. That is pakka. So you will be a bad doctor, but you will be a good doctor only after two months for that patient. But you are doing benefit or good for that patient. So what I have to stress here is never prescribe a combination. If you are uh, pakka, it is a tinea, give antifungal. It will work, systemic or topical antifungal. Again, this is tinea corporis, this peripheral activity. Whatever erythema is there, let it be there. Let it be there. Let it be there. Whatever the peripheral activity, let it be there. It will subside with topical and systemic antifungal. So these are the examples which I am going to show you. This uh, child presented to me, this child is having immunocompromised situation. This child presented to me with extensive tinea. This is tinea incognito, extensive tinea, but full of inflammatory lesions. Ideally, with this type of inflammation, you will be forced to start topical steroids, but never start topical steroid. This patient, uh, uh, I prescribed topical antifungal and systemic antifungal. 
after three to four days, they came back to me and told there is no relief. I never changed the treatment, but this is the result which I got after two weeks. This is what we should get. This is called as commitment. Commitment from the patient, from the doctor. You will get result. Stick on to, stick on to your diagnosis. If your diagnosis is correct, stick on to it. Whoever says, whatever they say, let them say. But you should be confident in your diagnosis. This is a case of tinea uh, pedis. Again, you can see a scaly border. So, this so everything I have told. Depending upon the type, we have the lesions, annular, the erythema, scaling, itching, peripheral activity, central clearing. Another thing which we are seeing here is the tinea capitis. Tinea capitis usually seen in children, but uh, very rarely we are seeing a lot of cases of tinea capitis. Usually it presents as black patch, gray patch, chelion, uh, or favus. The importance is that if a child comes with tinea capitis, that is tinea infection of the scalp, you should think of a protein deficiency, vitamin A deficiency. That is very important. So you have to uh, correct both this protein and vitamin deficiency, and it is highly communicable. Uh, so this is one of my patients with uh, chelion, inflammatory type of uh, tinea infection of the scalp. So here, uh, I was forced to start griseofulvin and other topical antifungals. Tinea capitis, you have to start griseofulvin. So coming to the management, first and foremost is hygiene, good hygiene. In these hot conditions, use loose clothes. Special care should be given to the fold. And if there are comorbid conditions, you have to treat the comorbid conditions. Systemic, we have fluconazole, itraconazole, carbinafin, griseofulvin. Nowadays, uh, earlier, uh, Fluconazole was seen in a lot of prescriptions. Nowadays, itraconazole is seen in all prescriptions. See, itraconazole, there is specific dosage regimen you have to give in that specific dose. Simply, you can't write uh, itraconazole. And before starting itraconazole, you have to do a LFT. Uh, itraconazole in all types of tinea infection, you can give itraconazole 100 mg BD for two weeks. And then ask the patient to review. Topical, you can give any of the antifungals, either it is terbinafin or clotrimazole or mitconazole, ketoconazole, anything. Uh, terbinafin system is 250 mg BD, you, can, you should give for two weeks. Risiofulvin, very rarely you have to give it for tinea capitis only. But tinea capitis, better you have to refer to a dermatologist. These are the topical treatment. We have clotri, keto, myconazole, terbinafin, eberconazole, cyclopirox, luliconazole, omorolfine. And one thing which I could I, I want to say is that nowadays a lot of resistance are occurring. Resistance occurs not due to the uh, factor in the drug, but I think resistance occurs because the patient is not using the drug properly. So what I do nowadays is for uh, majority of the patients will be coming from the periphery. They would have already taken fluconazole, itraconazole, etc. Everything from the periphery, but not properly taken. So what I do is I start with itraconazole. Systemic itraconazole, I give it for two weeks. I give strong antihistamine because the because of this hot climate nowadays, it will be very much pruritic. So the patient will be scratching, scratching always. So that will produce secondary bacterial infection. So we have to prevent that itching also. So you give strong systemic antihistamine. You give a systemic uh, antifungal. And topical, what I do nowadays is that I do, I give two types of antifungal, either terbinafin in the morning and in the night luliconazole. So if one resistance occurs, other one will act. So try that regimen. And if you are suspecting some erythema or some uh, super added bacterial infection due to scratching, you can add topical antibiotic also. Or you can combine this antifungal with an antibiotic cream, but not an antifungal with a, anti with a steroid. This is another uh, cutaneous candidiasis. Again, you can give systemic antifungal, topical antifungal, and antihistamines. So that is about superficial bacteria, uh, sorry, fungal infections. We have deep fungal infections also, sporotrichs, then chromoblastomycosis. We are coming across a lot of cases, but in the general practice, I think we don't have to manage such deep fungal infections. Next is a very common viral infection, which is molluscum contagiosa. A lot of children are coming to us with multiple molluscum. I don't know what to do with that much of multiple molluscum. They might have uh, gone to some of the homeopathic physicians and eruptive cases of molluscum have occurred. So this is usually seen in children 
if it is seen in adult you should think of a sexually transmitted disease and in children who is having atopic dermatitis due to this uh, in atopy we use more of topical steroids topical immunomodulators and because of the immunosuppressive effect in that particular child they are more prone to viral infection and more prone to molluscum so molluscum this is a dna virus pox viride so this is the characteristic clinical picture of molluscum so how will you diagnose molluscum the thing is this central umbilication if you see a papule a dome shaped papule with a central umbilication that is unless otherwise proved it is molluscum molluscum topical treatment it is very tough but uh, textbook say there is topical treatment like imiquimod of course i have tried topical retinoic acid then topical pills everything i have tried but the thing is that the child uh, it is very difficult to try a topical so after what we we'll do is we have to do extraction uh, radio frequency electrocautery or needle extraction or cryotherapy q lesions we can do extraction but uh, 50 to 60 type of lesions uh, usually i prefer i think such patients need general anesthesia and do extraction because this child won't lie on the table for extraction but q lesions you you should you should do extraction you have to extract the pox virus from that dome shaped nodule and if there is any bacterial infection treat that also hfmd i think hfmd is coming now caused by coxsackie virus these are the various family a5 a7 a9 10 b2 b5 enterovirus 71 which is seen among the adults also very commonly seen among less than 10 years with an incubation period of 4 to 7 days this is the cl characteristic clinical picture of hfmd what you are seeing is a papillo vesicle with this erythematous halo if you are seeing such a lesion on palm soles the genital area you can straight away diagnose it as and foot mouth disease this is a viral infection so what is the treatment the patient will be having severe pruritus so the child will be itching that results in secondary bacterial infection so you give topical antibiotic for itching you give systemic antihistamine if the systemic uh, infection you can try systemic antibiotics also no need of any antivirals etc this will subside by itself thing is that the patient presents with secondary bacterial infection so that, that has to be treated herpes zoster before going to herpes zoster actually i have not put a slide on varicella because everybody knows it and talks varicella what is the treatment regimen i'll just say uh, varicella we usually give uh, acyclovir 100 mg five times daily for eight days uh, and in chicken pox you have to advise the patient to bath daily no scrub bathing but use bath with soap and water proper adequate hydration and proper hygiene has to be told to the patient thing is that this is a superficial viral infection uh, the patient will have severe pruritus he will not take a bath on any days he will not take proper food no proper water he will sit and start itching that results in secondary bacterial infection and since this patient does not do a proper bathing this infection goes deep so from the epidermis it goes to the dermis subcutaneous what finally it will result in scarring that is what we are seeing in the chicken pox scar and finally the patient comes up uh, telling that they need treatment for the scar but how the scar has occurred they have not followed our advice so always advise the patient daily uh, cleaning of the body proper hydration proper food and uh, topical antibiotic cream to prevent the secondary bacterial infection once scarring occurred we can't do much to uh, reduce that scarring of course pigmentation of course we have depigmenting creams but for scarring it is difficult atrophic scarring this is herpes zoster everybody knows it affects the unilateral dermatome will be affected again uh, characterized by uh, vesicular lesions that is grouped vesicles the treatment here is you can give acyclovir 800 mg 5 times daily for 7 days or valacyclovir 1 g tid uh, famcyclovir any role for systemic steroids in herpes zoster no definitely no even in post herpetic neuralgia also i don't give systemic steroids and another thing is that is there any role of topical uh, 
this antiviral cream, a cyclovir cream in uh, herpes zoster as well as in uh, this uh, chicken pox, definitely no, because this virus resides inside the ganglion. No cream will go inside the ganglion. Topical, you can give topical antibiotic. Why? Because the patient scratches and he or she will get uh, topical, uh, this cutaneous secondary bacterial infection, but not definitely viral infection. So bacterial infection can be treated with topical antibiotic, but no role for acyclovir cream. Post-herpetic neuralgia, you can try oral analgesics, amitriptyline, carbamazepine, recently car gabapentin, uh, 300 mg started, which gradually you can increase the dose to 3600 mg in three divided dose over a period of four weeks. Post herpetic neuralgia, I usually give oral analgesics and post herpetic neuralgia proper care and abrupt start of antivirals can prevent this post herpetic neuralgia. Next is the parasitic infection. Very commonly seen is the scabies, which is seen among all races and classes, commonly seen in children. Low temperature, high humidity are the predisposing factors. The culprit here is the young fertilized mite. It requires a close contact for 15 to 20 minutes with the patient having scabies. One of the other predisposing factor is overcrowding. So this is caused by Scartopus scabies war communis. The fertilized female, the female is the culprit here. This can burrow the skin and it, these burrows are two millimeter deep. And it, once it burrow the skin, it will lay two to three eggs per day and after 30 days it will die but what happens this larva emerges and forms further burrows within 14 to 17 days that larva gets matured and this female excavates further deep into the skin but male dies off so female is a culprit here usually seen over hand wrist elbow feet angle penis this we call it as a circle of hebra the characteristic clinical features are itching, mostly nocturnal itching. Then on examination, you can see burrow, vacuole, vesicles, and excoriations. Management, what we are available in our FHCs, we have the uh, GBH, GABA benzene hexachloride, 6% precipitate sulfur, permethrin cream, benzyl benzoate, crotamiton, and ivermectin. In our busy OPD, it's very difficult to explain the application of permethrin cream or GBH or other topical creams to the patient. So what I do is I prescribe systemic ivermectin. For children less than six years, you give permethrin cream. In more than six years, you can safely prescribe that ivermectin, 6 mg, stat dose, repeat it after two weeks. And for children more than 12 years, Oh, sorry, more than 16 years, you can prescribe ivermectin 12 mg stat dose and repeat it after uh, two weeks. Of course, permethrin cream is effective, very effective, but mode of application you have to tell to the patient. It is 12 hour application. So today night, if you apply it 8 a.m., next day, uh, today night 8 p.m., next day 8 a.m., you have to wash it off. Ask the patient to reapply it after 10 days. What is the importance of reapplying it after 10 days? Because the 10th day, I told no, the larva, it matures by 10 to 14 days. So after 10th day, it matures and comes out. So that should also be taken care of. That is why you have to reapply it after 10 days. Pediculosis, very common, very common. Head loss caused by pediculosis humanis war capitis. These are all my own patients who is coming to the OPD presenting with this much amount of pediculosis. Another patient with extensive NICs. NICs, it should be mechanically removed. Pediculosis, you can give treatment with paralyzed 1% lotion or Ivoria shampoos can be used. Ivoria shampoo, 10 minute application. You ask the patient to apply it monthly. But uh, these type of lesions, no, I usually ask the patients to shave off this hair and then apply uh, this permethrin, uh, sorry, uh, paralyze or ivory shampoo. Because usually uh, if the hair, hair is shaven off, you'll have the scalp, you'll have the underlying bacterial infection. So that should also be treated in these cases. Otherwise, the child will be usually presenting to us with enlarged uh, this uh, cervical lymphadenopathy. The cause will be the pediculosis there. A very common condition, uh, which we are seeing nowadays, this is larva migrants. You can see this uh, larva, this is going like this, the, like a track, this is going. 
here we are giving albendazole 200 mg daily for four days you can give topical permethrin cream is also effective blister beetle dermatitis nowadays lot of college students are coming to us with bbd the acid fly attack uh, uh, this usually presents with a stinging sensation or a burning sensation with erythema and severe pain will be there Uh, so this is a type of irritant contact dermatitis so you can give topical here in this case you can add a topical steroid because this is an irritant dermatitis that irritancy should be reduced that can be reduced with topical steroid so you give a topical steroid with an antibiotic cream with systemic antibiotics and systemic anti hyper anti histamines now coming to other common conditions and just uh, rushing through the common conditions which we are seeing in our ofd the eczemas so eczema everybody know what is an eczema this is just an inflammatory pattern of the skin which is underlying or which shows that the skin has got underlying some other disease some external factors or an internal factor so this is just a reaction pattern of the skin eczema one thing we have to understand is eczema we have acute eczema sub acute eczema and chronic eczema so this if you are seeing here you can see a, a, an angry looking lesion this we call it as an acute eczema this is sub acute eczema the lesion has subsided and chronic eczema is seen as thick and dark and lichenified skin so once you diagnose it as acute chronic or sub acute the treatment differs In the case of acute eczema, as I have already shown here, this is an angry-looking lesion. Here, you give systemic antibiotic, systemic antihistamine. Anything you apply here, that will go off. Is there any role of steroids there? No. If it is severe inflammatory reaction affecting the life of the patient, you start a steroid. Of course, you can start, but this will subside with topic uh, systemic antibiotic and systemic antihistamine. Just give it for seven days. no role of topical steroid because this is an oozing or weeping lesion whatever you apply that will go off this is the result which i got after 7 days just top the systemic antibiotics and antihistamines so now this is a sub acute condition at this stage you can start the steroid eczema is at the condition where you should start topical steroids now the skin should exfoliate new skin should occur so for these thick and lesions you can give topical steroid either clobetazole or beta methazone or of course you can try salicylic acid creams also and any eczema the main stay of treatment there is emollient emollient is the main stay of treatment you have to apply emollient in the morning afternoon evening because dryness is a major culprit in all cases of eczema even if it is atopic eczema uh, dyshydrotic or eschatotic stasis eczema whatever eczema it is dryness is a major culprit so you apply emollients morning afternoon and evening you will get excellent results with topical steroid and if you are starting a topical steroid if you are starting a potent or mid potent or mild potent steroid always keep in mind you have to taper the dose of steroid and you have to stop the steroid so what i do is if i am in a position to start a potent steroid i usually start it on alternate days i get started alternate days for one month after that i will slowly taper to weekly twice weekly once monthly twice monthly once and then i will stop and what i do in between is i will slowly increase the dose of this uh, emollients so that the disease gets controlled but these are all chronic condition patient should be with you and patient should be committed you should be committed again this is a case of acute eczema see the weeping lesions is there any role of topical antibiotic or topical steroid here no no topicals will stand there it will go off you give systemic antibiotic and systemic antihistamine this is the response which i got after 7 days just this was treated with systemic antibiotic and systemic antihistamines now i got this as a sub acute stage so this sub acute stage i can start uh, steroid with antibiotic combinations with any molecule this is another case of eczema so this i will say it as sub acute case of eczema here if you want not much of vc or weeping or oozy lesions if you want you can start a topical steroid again this was uh, acute eczema treated with 
antibiotics and antihistamine acute stage it became sub acute form this stage you can start uh, topical steroid with antibiotic combination again another case of acute eczema see this is the result after 7 days no topicals was given just systemic antibiotic and antihistamine you just try you can see this type of results uh this is everybody knows a case of atopic dermatitis so atopic dermatitis again in children the main treatment here is topical steroids so you have to taper the dose of steroids you should be very careful once you start steroids but the main stay of treatment is good emollients you ask the mother to apply emollients every 4 hourly you ask the mother to apply emollients that will give excellent results in children in children usually atopy is seen over the extensor aspects but as age advances you can see the atopic lesions over the flexor aspects along with that you have to give systemic uh, antihistamines also and the child will be scratching if the child is having secondary bacterial infection you can start a systemic antibiotic also this is another case of contact dermatitis this child apply had severe headache migraine for which she applied the amrutanjan balm along with some garlic so resulted in severe allergic contact dermatitis these are the cases where you can start steroids so this was a severe case so i started topical steroids and antihistamine this was the result which i got after 2 weeks uh, it was going into a stage of hypopigmentation and uh, leucoderma which is called as vitiligo but at this stage since this lesion is going into a hypopigmented stage we have to start here immunomodulators tacrolimus was started and finally this result was achieved another case of contact dermatitis were for this pain this belladonna plaster was prescribed by some ayurvedic physician so that resulted in allergic contact dermatitis resulting in blister and bulle this is a case of drug reactions two type of drug reactions occur to us one is fixed drug reaction reaction a uh, fixed drug eruption and another is everybody knows about the uh, steven johnson syndrome so if a patient presents with this uh, hyperpigmented lesions or patches not confluent patches but single patches with a history of taking a tablet most commonly i'm seeing it uh, with patients taking diclofenac paracetamol you should diagnose it as fixed drug eruptions fixed drug eruption is that that will be fixed to only that area it will not spread but further if that patient takes further that drug the patient can go for steven johnson syndrome this should be treated with stoppage of the drug topical steroids and if it is uh, increasing definitely you can think of starting a systemic steroids or other modalities of treatment this the child applied some eye drops resulting in uh, allergic contact dermatitis next the very common condition which we are seeing in our opd is the acne vulgaris lot of children are coming and i think just because now in calicut we are having the ghd all cases of acne are coming to us i think not to fhcs or other taluk centers so acne this is a pilosebaceous gland oversensitive to normal androgen levels after puberty this results in increased sebum production and an oily skin resulting in keratinocytes adherent to follicular canal with ductal hyperpornification resulting in open comedons proliferation of p acne the bacterial enzymes break down and finally resulting in the lesion of acne vulgaris so we can have non inflammatory acne inflammatory acne non inflammatory acne it is characterized by the white heads as well as the black heads inflammatory acne characterized by pacure pustule and nodules and the important thing is that the social symptoms loss of self confidence anxiety depression and they may withdraw from the society also many youngsters coming to us with these symptoms loss of self confidence and they are uh, they they just withdraw from the society and they want sudden results but sudden results we can't give so the clinical types we have the non inflammatory and inflammatory non inflammatory we are having the open and closed comedons papules pustules inflammatory we have erythematous papule pustule and possibly scarring that we call it as mild moderate severe so in the case of mild cases we have a specific regimen 
moderate, we have specific regimen. Severe cases, we have the various surgical options also available. The first line and alternative treatment options. The first line treatment for mild acne vulgaris include benzoyl peroxide or a topical retinoid or a combination of topical medication consisting of benzyl peroxide and an antibiotic. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just say uh, in, uh, in an easy way. So the first line treatment, mild acne, uh, acne vulgaris, patient presents to you with comedons, open and closed comedons. In that case, you give a systemic antibiotic, azithromycin is good, you can give, or if the patient is tolerable, you can start doxycycline. What I start is benzoyl peroxide keratolytic action. So this open comedons and closed comedons will go off. But you have to specifically say to the patient how to apply benzyl peroxide. That should be like spot applications over the lesions only. This is highly irritant. So you ask the patient to wash it off after 5 minutes or 10 minutes. Whole night application, you never ask the patient to apply benzyl peroxide. So <coughs> systemic antibiotic like azithromycin with topical benzyl peroxide or you can use topical retinoid. We have clindamycin with adapalene combination. That also you can ask the patient to apply. So what I do is to prevent the resistance, I ask the patient to apply clindamycin with adapalene combination weekly thrice. And benzoyl peroxide, if, I, if the patient apply clindamycin adapalene combination on Monday, Wednesday and Friday, the patient will be applying benzoyl peroxide on Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. So you can uh, reduce the occurrence of resistance also. And this mode of application should be spot application and it should be washed off after 5 minutes or 10 minutes. And these retinoids as well as benzyl peroxide, they are highly photosensitive. Always ask the patient to apply a sunscreen. The, this is also very important because acne skin means oil prone skin or oily skin. So oily skin, if you ask the patient to apply some sunscreen like a lotion or a creamy formulation. Again, lot of eruptions will occur. So oily skin, you ask the patient to apply sunscreen gel, gel-based preparations. So that is very important. In the case of moderate acne vulgaris also, the same regimen, combination of benzyl peroxide and topical antibiotics. Severe acne vulgaris, oral antibiotic, benzyl peroxide, topical antibiotic, topical retinoid or both. And severe acne vulgaris, you are justified to start oral isotretinoin also. Oral isotretinoin, better refer to a dermatologist because before starting this uh, oral retinoid, thing is that you have to go for a eye pledge regimen or eye pledge should be followed. So there are a lot of protocols to be uh, uh, followed before starting isoretinoin, but we are giving, everybody is giving isoretinoin, but it should be started with pro proper protocols and proper blood investigations. Is there any role of diet in acne? Many patients will be asking, should I uh, reduce this thing or the specific changes in diet are not recommended to treat acne, but developing informations indicate that acne may be related to a high glycemic index and limited data indicate that some diary, especially skim milk can worse acne. There is insufficient evidence to endorse recommendations related to antioxidants, probiotics and fish oils. So what I, uh, advice to the patient is that reduce these types, skin milk, skin milk, and of course, I ask them to reduce uh, chocolates, etc. This is highly a controversial topic, the role of diet. About the hormonal agents, spironolactin, lactone can be benefit in some females, but I have not started uh, this spironolactone. Isotretin, I have already told, and these guidelines sources from the American Academy of Dermatology. So these are the few cases which I would like to present here is this patient presented with, is this a mild or moderate? No, this is severe case of acne vulgaris. So this patient was started on uh, systemic doxycycline. <clears throat> the patient was given topical uh, retinoids, topical antibiotic, as well as topical benzoyl peroxide. And one of the best treatment now available for such conditions here is either you can go for a PRP treatment or a PRF. I uh, personally do PRF that is platelet-rich fibrin. So from the, uh, we'll be taking about 10 ml of blood from the patient and from that we'll be taking the plasma, uh, PRF, after centrifuging it and this PRF will be injected to all these areas. So what it does, this PRP or PRF contains the growth factors. 
so collagen building growth factors uh, epithelial growth factors vascular endothelial growth factors everything is there so collagen remodeling is occurring so all these scars will be very much reduced and this is the final result which i got in a patient with severe case of acne vulgaris on treatment with prf this is uh, another severe case of acne vulgaris the patient presented with acne scarring this we have the box scarring road scarring ice pick scars roll on scars etc very difficult to manage but again prf is one of the gold standard treatment for treating these type of acne scars this is 3 uh, weeks after first sitting of prf with a thread lift and various other procedures combination procedures was done here one thing you have to keep in mind why this scarring occurred proper treatment proper treatment protocol was not uh, adapted by this patient he went on picking these lesions that ultimately result in scarring because earlier that will be an epidermal lesion once you make it a dermal or subcutaneous lesion scarring occurs and once scarring occurs it is very difficult but still you can get around 40 to 50 percentage results like this this is another treatment for this uh, acne scarring this is called as the threads one of the latest treatment for this scarring uh, we are using cork threads mono uh, monofilament uh, threads these threads we are introducing into this acne scars and then we will withdraw these needles there are specific needles for this uh, thread uh, thread lifts and what happens is that these the uh, threads will be retained inside that acne scars and that will act as a foreign body and that will produce inflammation finally resulting in fibrosis and collagen formation so once collagen formation occurs the scars will go up so this this is also having get, we are also getting excellent results with this type of threads another common condition this is a psoriasis vulgaris everybody knows about psoriasis which is a condition which is characterized by a plaque with surface showing scaling silvery scales with more of itching and the patient presents with fewer lesions over the itchy areas or over the sites of trauma which we call it as kobner phenomenon psoriasis we have different type of psoriasis scalp psoriasis sebo psoriasis nail psoriasis chronic plaque gut ache psoriasis etc thing is that the management uh, psoriasis cases you have to start steroids steroids topical steroids but not systemic steroids systemic steroids you can start in the case of exfoli uh, exfoliative dermatitis secondary to psoriasis that is psoriasis occurring over more than 80 percentage of the body surface area other modalities are methotrexate aprilimast phototherapy vitamin d3 analog acitrine cyclosporine and biological just is, just thing is that you know you have to know how to diagnose psoriasis and then refer to the dermatologist another very common condition which we are seeing nowadays is the telogen effluvium post covid of course there are a lot of urticaria lesions are seeing uh, post covid and in post covid we are seeing lot of cases of telogen effluvium because of this viral infection this telogen effluvium will be present in that patient for at least 6 months because the hair cycle it goes into the telogen state so again to come into the anagen state it will take about 7 to 8 months so in between the patient will be highly concerned and they will be coming to you with telogen effluvium simple you can supplement with vitamins either biotin or iron i find excellent results if i supplement the patient with iron and zinc iron and zinc is giving excellent result but if you are more interested you can try prp therapy in this telogen effluvium where you can get excellent result plasma is separated and same growth factors where we have the vascular endothelial and follicle derived growth factors that can result in early uh, conversion of this hair cycle into anagen phase resulting in more uh, production of hairs and dermatology is not complete if i don't touch up cosmetology the various cosmetological aspects in dermatitis we have the anti aging therapy the botox fillers prf as well i have already told the threads the lasers hair transplant and chemical peels and these i don't know whether it will be the method of anti aging therapy as well as this particular patient uh, uh, this uh, uh, she is uh, going for a best uh, world title so we did this uh, forehead tightening in that uh, lady here what i am doing is i am injecting prf along with few botox injections i am giving in this patient Uh, 
Necesita que me quede con el chico, 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 que me quede con Uh, various peels which gives a good young glowing skin these are all anti aging procedures this is the scar subsection and thread lift which we are doing This patient presented with uh, this keloid and hypertrophic scar uh, following uh, top surgery. For that, we did this uh, carbon dioxide laser. These are all the latest techniques which we are doing. This is the result. Earlier, the patient presented with a scar like this, hypertrophic scar. This is after uh, one month of the treatment. And this is the final result, which I got after two, two months of treatment. Uh, this is a case where we are uh, doing the surgical correction for acne scar. In this case, what I've already told the PRF, I'm injecting PRF into that acne scars. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is the thread lift, which is the latest procedure. Thread lift means you are, uh, if you are having a sagging skin, we will be lifting the skin like that and you will be looking more young. That is called as a thread lift. Newer procedure where threads are introduced inside the skin that will be retained in that skin. Now Botox is all uh, becoming outdated. Threads are coming up because Botox has its own side effects, but threads has no side effects. And once you introduce the threads, that will stay there at least for one year. After one year only, you have to do the second treatment. So this is the thread lift, which has been done on a patient. Are the various procedures which we are doing in our hospital setup, our government hospitals, and we get we got a lot of appreciation from the from our own patients itself. They post uh, <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. Good evening. Uh, if there are any doubts, uh, anyone may please unmute and uh, ask question to the speaker. infection of the nail one question has come out from the chat box yes nail fungal infection uh, that's a good question which i failed to mention there here thing is that again the word commitment is very important you have to give systemic antifungal i would prefer fluconazole 150 mg once weekly you ask the patient to take it for at least one year 
Along with that, you prescribe a topical antifungal. That also, you should ask the patient to continue it for one year because nail, you just see, nail growth is 0.1 millimeter per day. So it will take long and long for getting results for such an infection. Yes, a lot of questions. Uh, treatment of corn. Treatment of corn, okay. Uh, before diagnosing it as a corn or a veruca, one thing we have to keep in your mind, how will you differentiate between a veruca and a corn? Veruca means it's a fungal infection. Corn means it is just thickening of the skin. So you just directly apply pressure over the lesion. On direct pressure, if the lesion or if the patient says it is painful, that is a corn. But on lateral application of the pressure, if the patient says it is painful, that is varuka. So varuka means you have to do either punch excision, electrocautery, radio frequency, or you can try topical salicylic acid cream because you have to get rid of that, that uh, virus from that body. Corn means that is just thickening of the skin. So you can ask the patient to avoid area. So you can ask the patient to wear appropriate footwear and you can use what is called as the topical salicylic acid cream with a emollients. Emollients is very important. Another question which I found there was treatment of melasma, a very difficult one. See, melasma, majority of the females uh, age of uh, 40 to 45, they develop melasma. Why they develop melasma? Because of no proper skin care. Because uh, uh, by the age of 30 years, or I would say even at least from the age of 25 years, you have to start using sunscreen. 40, 45 means hormonal changes of course, uh, environmental factors. Play and melasma. Over the second options, we have uh, systemic tablets. We can try glutathione tablets. We can try uh, this tranexamic acid. Uh, everything you can try. Topical, you can try uh, depigmenting agents. We have acetic acid. We have glycolic acid, kojic acid, but never try triple regimen. Majority uh, patients will be coming to me after application of uh, this one uh, sun uh, skin light cream. Mela Care, Mela Plus, etc. That you uh, should that that is freely available there, but you ask the patient never apply because it consists of topical steroids. Again, topical steroids will reduce the pigmentation, but on sun exposure, what happens is uh, this one uh, photocontact dermatitis will occur, and again this lesion will exacerbate. So you try a depigmenting cream, try chemical peels, try. Uh, NDI glazes. You can also try injection vitamin C also. And recently, PRF is also very beneficial in such patients. Yes, yeah, one question. Uh, I have answered. Flocodasol can be can it be given to children? Very good question. I usually prescribe proper. Because in children, majority, they will be presenting to us with a single lesion or a uh, one or two lesions. So it can be easily managed with topical treatments. Prickly heat treatment. Yeah, that is called as malaria rubra pilaris. So what is the uh, factor there? Uh, why malaria occurs? Because there is blockage of this uh, small sweat text. So in such cases, you ask the patient to have... Uh, daily twice or thrice bathing with soap and water and never apply anything because if you apply any topicals again you are going to block the sweat text and this will again exacerbate so just symptomatic the patient will be uh, actually uh, having pruritus you give some systemic anti-pruritic things permitting application method can be printed on a paper and displayed or else make a video or how to apply. That is very good. In BCOP, we can try that. Percentage of salicylic acid for topical application. Yes. In our FHCs, uh, salicylic acid 6% is available. Salicylic acid 6%, uh, 3%, 6, 12, 20, 40 is available. I go for 12%. Do itraconazole always need LFT. It is better you do a LFT. How do we apply benzyl benzoate for scabies? Same schedule as permethrin. 
Benzyl benzoate, uh, it is two point uh, sorry twenty five percentage is available. You have to apply whole body, twelve hour application, three days consecutive application. Thing is that it will result ultimately in either irritant contact dermatitis or allergy contact dermatitis, and it will be it will be very foul smell also. So better don't try that. So I think I have answered major, uh, every questions here in the chat box. Yeah, one more question. Uh, how you treat candidal intertrigo? That is a very good question. So candidal intertrigo. So usually occurring over the intertrigenous region. From the name itself, candida. So that is a fungal infection. So underlying there is a fungal infection. But due to this constant itching, what happens? There will be super added bacterial infection. So what you will give? Topical antibiotic or topical antifungal, what you will give. Since this is an underlying fungal infection, you start systemic antifungal. Since there is a super added bacterial infection, you give topical antibiotic with a systemic antihistamine. You try it, you will get results, excellent results. Can we use Castellani's paint in intertrigo? Of course, you can use Castellani's paint, but ultimately that will stain your clothes. That is also good. These are all uh, old methods of treatment. Still, you can use. Children with hypopigmented patch over the face diagnosis and treatment. Yes, hypopigmented patch. Usually, children presenting with a hypopigmented patch, you have to think of conditions like pityriasis alba, tinea versicolor, photo contact dermatitis. How will you differentiate between pityriasis alba and tinea versicolor? Tinea versicolor, as I've already shown in the picture, it, there'll be a cyclical borders. You can clearly see the borders and you can clearly see the scaling. But in case of pityriasis alba, it will be a erythematous lesion and there will be no proper borders. Borders will be merging with the normal skin. So once you diagnose P alba or tinea versicolor, management is different. For P. alba, you have to start mild topical steroid. But Tinea versicola, you have to start topical antifungal. In the case of photocontact dermatitis, definitely that history will be there and the lesions will be more over the forehead and other, other photocontact areas will also be involved in photocytic. Then another thing is vitiligo. Uh, vitiligo can also present as a hypopigmented, but it will be more of a depigmented patch. There will be a, a milky hue to the lesion. There will be a Depigmented patch. Yeah, P. I, I think I have told the differentiation between P. alba and P. tinea versicolor and P. alba treatment also. I think uh, there are no more doubts. Anyone? Uh, uh, one more question. Yeah, onycholysis topical treatment. Onycholysis depends upon the cause. Why, uh, why their onycholysis has occurred? Is it a fun due to fungal or underlying psoriatic lesion or underlying lichen planus lesion? You have to uh, differentiate between them. If it is a uh, psoriatic lesion, you have to treat the psoriasis with uh, topical retinoids. If it is lichen planus, treat with topical steroids. Or if it is a fungal lesion, as I've already mentioned, you can start nail lacquers or topical antifungals. So as you said, better to use sunscreen after 35 years. I, I, I told it is better, but it is good if you use it by 25 years onwards. On eicomycosis, I have told the treatment, you start systemic and topical uh, antifungals. Sunscreen of choice depends. Sunscreen of choice depends upon the type of the skin. Whether you are having an oily, you are having a dry skin, or you are having a mixed skin. If you are having an oily skin, go for gel preparations. Mixed skin, you can use lotions. Dry skin, go for creams. Pitted keratosis. Uh, pitted keratosis, actually we have pitted keratolysis and pitted keratosis. Pitted keratolysis, that is a bacterial infection which can be treated with topical antibiotics. Pitted keratosis, you have to start topical steroids. Good to see the questions are flowing. Erythrasma also important to clear with protonosome. 
Yeah, erythrasma. Why erythrasma reported to clear with clotrimazole? I have told erythrasma is basically a bacterial infection. So your diagnosis might be wrong. It might be a fungal infection. If it is true erythrasma, it will not uh, get cleared with topical clotrimazole. It might be a tinea versicolor or other tinea infection. I think uh, we can uh, conclude the session. Even in uh, even on a short uh, 